Wow. Hi, everyone. So wonderful. So wonderful to see you in blue. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for this uh, lovely introduction. But I must say I'm uh, feeling a bit overwhelmed now after that introduction. A lot of pressure, a lot of stress. Um, and um, Sarah, I know you can hear me now, and I know you, know you were my student 24 years ago when you were uh, five years old. <laughs> yeah, I was much older, I was 15. Um, and uh, I would like to also teach you a lesson today, if you don't mind, about uh, introductions, because I do feel pressure now. So, so, so what I'm gonna just share with you, uh, this is for Sarah, but you can listen if you want. <laughs> Um, the, the best introduction that I've ever had uh, in, uh, in a conference. So this was in um, Silicon Valley. I was speaking to a large high-tech uh, company. And um, the uh, CEO of the company, this was... Um, uh, in, people came from in different places. It was their yearly gathering. He got on stage, the CEO, to introduce me. And he says, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon. It's uh, Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar. Um, and the reason we invited Tal to speak to us today is because he's the cheapest speaker we found. <laughs> I kid you not. Now, Sarah, after that, I could do no wrong. You know, the bar was very low. To <laughs> More challenging today, but I'll do my best, I promise. So, um, I'm going to talk to you about teaching happiness, but before that, I want to share with you um, something which I think is important for us in this context. Um, you've been sitting for a long time. There, is, um, there are more and more doctors today who talk about sitting as the new smoking. Now, based on research, they are exaggerating, but not by much. Another study, this is out of the University of Cambridge, England, tells us that when they do an ESM, uh, experiential sampling method, in other words, study happiness at the moment, if the person has moved over the past 20 minutes, that person is more likely to be happy. Mind-body or body-mind connection. Which is why I suggest, let's take a minute, just let's get up, and, uh, and this is very simple. Just run up and down this theater. No, I'm kidding. No, no, no. Just 10 steps on the spot. That's all. If you want, you can run. Hands up if you want. Whew. All right. Now you're ready to be happy. So, Carl Rogers, Carl Rogers, the psychologist, back in the 1950s said, what is most personal is most general. What is most personal is most general. So I want to share with you um, my personal take on teaching, based on research, uh, of course, in the hope that it will be general, that you can take it away and apply it in your life as a teacher. And as a teacher, not just in the classroom, whether you're a coach or a therapist or a parent or a school teacher or a partner. And I want you to think about this in the context of your life, both professional and personal. And this is personal for me because this is the way I've been teaching, whether it was 24 years ago when uh, I had Six students in my class, later in the bigger class at Harvard, and today with a certificate in happiness studies as well as the masters in happiness studies that we teach. And the way we teach is that we really focus on the what and the how. And we have a role model. 
the role model is the person we call the father of the field of happiness studies. And that is Aristotle. Aristotle wrote a book called The Nicomachean Ethics, where he lays the groundwork for much of the research that we're doing today in our universities. He distinguishes between pleasure and meaning, between the hedonistic and the eudaimonistic approach to happiness. He also talks about happiness as the highest end, the end towards which all other ends lead. So that's the what of happiness. But he also teach, talks about the how of teaching happiness, specifically in his book on the art of rhetoric. And he defines rhetoric as the faculty of discovering in any particular case all of the available means of persuasion. And specifically, he talks about three ways, three pathways, in a sense, through which we can persuade our listeners. And again, whether they are our children, whether they are our coaches, or students, or parents, three pathways. The first one is the path of pathos. This is about emotion. This is about passion. Emotion comes from the word motion, emotion, to, and to move, to move away from. We need emotion if we want to persuade feelings. We also need ethos. Ethos is about the speaker, the teacher. How do you garner authority from an audience? How do you get them to trust you? And the third important pathway for teaching is through logos, through logic, through the mind, through thinking, through reason. And these three pathways are critical if we want to maximize our potential for persuasion for teaching, because that's what we're doing as teachers. We want to persuade our students to exercise regularly. We want to persuade our coachee to, um, uh, to express gratitude regularly. We want to persuade him to be kinder, to listen better. Whatever we're doing, we're teaching, we're persuading. So Aristotle wrote this a couple of years ago. I uh, don't know exactly how. <laughs> um, the interesting thing is, though he did write it 2,500 years ago, Today, what psychology is showing that these are the three pathways to bringing about change. Research in psychology talks about the ABCs of psychology as the path to change. The A stands for affect, affect, pathos, emotion. Talks about behavior, what we do, how we act, so that we gain the trust, the authority, to bring about change. And finally, it's about cognition, the C. And cognition is about reason and logos. And what I want to do now is go over each one of those three, just say a little bit about them, and I'll go from the last to the first, so CBA. And we'll start with cognition, logos. And this is about introducing research in our teaching. We are teaching the science of happiness. And again, whether it's in a university course, of course, or in our certificate program, or of course, in the master's degree. And this is what will distinguish the field of happiness studies from the self-help movement. You see, the self-help movement or the New Age movement. There's a lot of charisma there. There's a lot of passion there. However, it doesn't rely on research, and that's unfortunate because very often, the adherents, the students in this area, pay a price. And if we want the field of happiness studies to be a serious field that organizations and universities and clients and schools 
accept and embrace and see as serious, and if we wanted to have the impact that it can have, we must connect it. We must, as Sarah mentioned, connect between the ivory tower and Main Street. Create that bridge. I want to give you an example of where we can do that. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the book, The Secret. The Secret talks about the importance of beliefs as self-fulfilling prophecies. It talks about the law of attraction. It relies on the work of um, Napoleon Hill in his book, Think and Grow Rich, where he says, whatever you can conceive and believe, you can achieve. Wow, that's inspiring, that's terrific, that's great, that's important. And it's true, partially. But they forget the partially. And it seems from reading those books that everything that you think about and imagine, you can actually attract into your life. So does that, does that mean that if I didn't succeed in something, I just didn't think hard enough, didn't attract it enough? And what if I get sick? Did I attract this? So you can see where this can go. First of all, it can lead, and it does in many cases, lead to lack of action, laziness. Why should I? I just need to think, and I'll grow rich. I just need to imagine success, and that's enough. Or if I'm sick, the guilt that I feel for being sick, or maybe the lack of compassion because she brought it on herself. No, sometimes these things happen and it has nothing to do with what we think. And this is where research comes in. It tells us, yes, of course beliefs are important. They're very important for success, for well-being. Mindsets matter a great deal. But that's not everything. It's just part of the equation. How much of the equation is it? Well, that's where we have research. That's where we have, where, where we have studies by the likes of University of Rome professor Concetta Perschelli and other researchers around the world who look at self-efficacy, which basically means believe in yourself. But they look at it through the scientific lens and they understand, they understand the boundaries, the limits of beliefs as self-fulfilling prophecies. And when we make the case for happiness, we need to make it through science. So when we go into organizations, we invite them into the scientific realm. And that's how we attract more clients. And that's how we have more impact. And that's how we persuade more. So that's cognition. Then we have behavior, and that's about leading by example. Why is that important? Because we have mirror neurons, and people ultimately do what you do rather than what you say. Because when I do something, when I'm kind, for example, that's contagious. I can tell my child, be honest. And if they see me honest, they'll be honest. But if they see me being dishonest, it doesn't matter what I tell them. They'll follow my lead. Research by the tension here is just, I can feel it. <laughs> Research by Kuzis and Posner on modeling the way. They talk about how leading by example is the number one characteristic of great leadership. And I want to do a quick exercise with you to, to demonstrate this. So, this is an experiment. It hurts just a little bit, not, not too much, don't worry. So here's what I'd like you to do. Take your hand and create a 90 degree angle. All right, now take your middle finger and your thumb and create a circle, okay? And try and keep the other fingers straight. This is where it gets difficult, <laughs> especially for the men in this room. We are less flexible. Okay, so you, you have a circle. Now take the circle, can you see? Circle, not square, guys. <laughs> now take the circle and put it on your cheek. 
on your cheek. Okay, thank you. So, most people, most people put it on there. You know, I know I have a bit of an accent, I'm sorry about that, but I still said very clearly, cheek. Because people do what you do much more so than what you say. In the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, what you do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. And you establish authority as a teacher, you establish trust, you garner listening from the audience when you walk your talk. Now, how do you walk your talk when it comes to teaching self-confidence, beliefs as self-fulfilling prophecy? You try, you cope, you put yourself on the line. It's not about succeeding. That actually matters a lot less. What matters more is that you put yourself on the line. And if your students see you act with self-confidence, in other words, taking risks, trying things, experimenting, falling down, getting up again, that is how you lead by example when you teach about self-efficacy. Now, what about when it comes to the third element, affect, pathos, emotions? This is where stories come in. You know, Einstein and uh, Niels Bohr and Max Planck and you know, many of the great, and Marie Curie, talked to the, the great scientists, talked about finding the unified theory of the universe. They, they, they looked for this one, um, um, one uh, formula that explains everything in physics. They never found it, maybe we never will, maybe it's above our pay, pay grade as, as human beings to discover it. But there is a unifying theory of psychology, and that is stories. You see, everywhere you look in psychology, you find stories. Cognitive psychology, what do we remember best? We remember stories. Organizational psychology, the best leaders, storytellers. What is therapy about? Telling stories, telling your own story and feeling better as a result. Everywhere you look in psychology, you find stories, the unifying theory, and you find it as well and it's important to find it in teaching. Why? Because stories move us. And if it's just research, not enough to move us. So yes, it's important to read the study on self-efficacy. Extremely important to teach it. That's how you, es you establish the logos, the cognitive part. But that's just part of the equation. The second part has to be stories. And I want to tell you the story of Roger Bannister. Up until the year 1954, running the mile in under four minutes was considered impossible. Runners all over the world ran the mile in four minutes and two seconds and three seconds, but no one could break the four-minute barrier. In fact, doctors, physiologists, proved that it was impossible to break the four-minute barrier. Physiologically impossible. The limit of human ability. They got close to it, but they never could break the four minutes. And then came along Roger Bannister, at the time a student at Oxford University. And he said, it's possible to do it, and I will do it. No one took him really seriously for various reasons. First of all, it's impossible. We proved it. But second, he ran at that time at 4 minutes and 12 seconds. He was a good runner, not the best. But he said, it's possible and I'm going to do it. And he continued trying. And he improved. And he got to 4 minutes and 3 and 4 minutes and 2 seconds and plateaued. It's impossible after all, but he said, I will do it. May 1954, on his home turf at Oxford University, Roger Bannister ran the mile in 3 minutes and 59 seconds. Sensation, front page news all over the world. The dream mile, the impossible made possible. Science defied, doctors defied. The brick wall, the fortress was shattered. Because you know what? 
the more amazing thing about the story, six weeks later. Now, for de since the time we started measuring, no one had broken the four-minute barrier. Six weeks later, John Landy, an Australian runner, runs the mile in three minutes and 58 seconds. In the following year, 37 runners run the mile in under four minutes. The year after that, they stopped counting. <laughs> Today, the world record is around three minutes and 43 seconds. Now, what happened that day in May 1954? What happened was that a mental barrier was lifted. A psychological fortress was lifted. And what it showed us is how powerful the mind is, because it's not that they got new running shoes in June of 1954. It's not that they devised new technologies to run better in 1954. It was just one thing. Suddenly they understood that it's possible. Look at the power of our mind, the limitations and the breaking thereof. So when you teach self-efficacy, that story illustrates it so much better. And my students today, 25 years later, they may not remember the research by Bendura on self-efficacy, but they will remember the story of Roger Bannister or Helen Keller. And stories move us. So where is teaching going? What is the future of happiness studies? Technology is here to stay. And the question is, what do we do with it? Do we use it or are we abused by it? One of the ways that we teach is through movies. And one of the movies that captures this schism between the use and abuse of technology is The Green Mile. Now, those of you who have seen it, great. If you haven't, highly recommended. It. It's basically a modern rendition of John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. And electricity is a theme throughout. And it shows that electricity can bring light, we can use it as a life support system, or it can electrocute an innocent man. So electricity, is it good or bad? Depends if you use it or abuse it. It's the same with technology. We need to learn to use it. And there is great potential. You know, when I heard Mark Zuckerberg talk about the metaverse, I remember being both um, at the same time um, very nervous and scared because I know what technology does to our well-being. And will that mean that we don't meet again? At the same time, it's also full of hope because imagine teaching Aristotle or Plato and visiting Athens and walking around Athens, all of us together in three dimensions, hearing it, seeing them, having them talk to us. What an amazing experience that could be for education. So we need to learn how to use it. And yet, and yet, when we teach happiness, we still need to have the human contact, the connection. You know, when we started the, our programs, the certificate initially, and later we had the same debate around the master's degree, we said, do we make it an in-person? Because there are so many advantages to being in the same room. Do we have it online? or some form of hybrid, and we decided to go online for the obvious advantages of technology. Because we have students from more than 85 countries. That would never have happened if we had an on-campus degree. But we knew that we were paying a price. So what did we do? We said, how can we have the best of both worlds? We'll have our degree or our certificate program 100% online. And then we'll create retreats. And these retreats will be optional. Whoever is around and wants to come can come. We had a retreat yes, yesterday, yesterday it ended. 
We had a retreat for three days where we met together. We have retreats all over the world where we meet together in person. And this is a way of capitalizing on the advantages of technology and at the same time not losing the human touch, which is so important for happiness, for teaching happiness and for being happy, which is also why I'm so grateful for Wohasu. Because what Wohasu does is bring us together with our pathos, our emotions, with our being, with our ethos, with our minds, with our logos. It brings us together so that we can celebrate happiness. Thank you.